Welcome classic rock fans to another one of my 10 of the best and today we're looking at 10 records that changed my life and the first record I want to talk about is Rave On by Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Now years ago my mother had one of these little record players where all the, you would stack all the singles up and they would, they would drop and play each one like a little bit like a jukebox with a built-in speaker. I used to sit there and play all the wonderful records she had, uh, Dusty Springfield, the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand was there. There was um, a couple of Tommy Steele records as well, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was this one, of course, where it's drawn out hiccup as a, a start. It seemed almost subversive. It certainly didn't conform to what I understood was good singing, as according to my father, which was uh, um, and the, the epitome of good singing as far as he, he was concerned was Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, Nat King Cole, and people like that, the crooners. So my mother was very much uh, more into rock and roll and, and there was this song and I used to play it and the way he'd sing it, it, it bristled with energy. I remember as a child the hairs standing up on my arm as I listened to it and I used to almost shake with excitement when it was playing. I think it said to me at a very early age, it suggested to me the possibilities of how music can affect your life. There's no doubt about it that, that that strumming guitar and that very distinctive vocal style seized my young imagination. And it seems so very different from the, the sort of background music that uh, uh, of my father's records, which were things like Burr Lives and people like that. This, this seemed, this demanded your attention. Interesting story for you. In the 1950s, my mother and father lived in Hounslow, which is West London. And uh, when my father, whenever my father did night shifts or late shifts, my mother would uh, sneak off to concerts and things like that with a friend of hers. And there's some of the gigs she went to. She went, she saw uh, Bill Haley and the Comets, and one of the gigs she went to was uh, Buddy Holly and the Crickets in Hammersmith. It was Hammersmith. Now she said it was Hammersmith Odeon, which I can't believe. I, I think she must have got that wrong because I, th I think the Hammersmith Odeon was a cinema at this time. But I think. I must check out the Buddy Holly UK dates for 1958 and see if he played anywhere in Hammersmith and that's probably the gig she attended, but uh, it's pretty cool. The next record I want to talk about is Pink Floyd, The Wall. Now this album came into our house in 1979, uh, Christmas 1979. Of course I was, I'd just started at secondary school, I was in my first year, I must have been 11 I guess. And um, my brother wanted this, he, we really liked the song Another Brick in the Wall which was a huge hit of course. And my brother liked the album, or he expressed an interest in the album because my mother bought it for him for Christmas. I remember listening to it and sort of thinking, I, I had no idea music could sound like this. I mean, I expected the very conventional, you know, verse, chorus, bridge, verse to fade sort of structure, but, but this, was, was, this was something else. It, um, and now a friend of mine and I, we used, to, we used to play Mother over and over again and just laugh at the line where he says, Mother, uh, will they break my balls? I mean, how mature was that, eh? But there's no doubt about it, this is an important moment in my musical journey, an important signpost, because of course, as I developed an interest in music, you start to, I developed a love of Pink Floyd, that introduction was there, well established, so I started looking at other Pink Floyd albums. Of course, then you start looking at the topography that surrounds that band, what, what else can you listen to? I mean, I've often said uh, I would have probably grown up as a very, different person had in 1979 my brother asked for Michael Jackson's Off the Wall instead. The next one I want to talk about is a compilation album, it's The Shadows Greatest Hits. My father used to play this quite a lot, which surprised me really because I really didn't think it was his bag. But I just I just remember being enamoured with those reverb drenched guitars and, and the overall sound and melody of it. You know, by the time I was uh, about 11 or 12, I must have been probably the best air guitarist in the street. Not to mention I got the step down really well as, uh, as well. But there's no doubt about it, their overall sound was immersive and, and beguiling. Uh, in fact, I've, I've read interviews with so many guitarists, famous guitarists, including David Gilmour, who have said that the shadows were very influential, their sound was very influential. And you can, you can see that influence in many respects, because the shadows were all about expression and tone. And Apache, I mean, what, a great, what great number is Apache? Now, Apache was originally recorded by Burt Whedon, but I think The Shadows did it a lot better. Interesting, I went to see The Shadows in the late 80s. Uh, I went to see them at the Reading Hexagon. Uh, I took my mother, I believe, but it was a, a wonderful show. I really enjoyed it. I have no idea where they are now, though, to be honest with you. The next record is Kings of the Wild Frontier by Adam and the Ants. I remember seeing him on top of the pops and just being mesmerized. The energy and the sound was just remarkable. It sounded so fresh 
for the time. I mean, this was, this was a, a, a landscape where, where everything seemed so dull and grey, a landscape marred by the spit and nihilism of punk, as I, as I often say. But, you know, that look and that swagger drawn from those um, heroic motifs, you know, the iconography of anti-heroes, the pirate, the high woman, the Indian brave, it, uh, it just, I found it electrifying, to be honest with you. And, and the sound as well is the reverb drenched guitars, so those heavily layered vocals, those whoops and yells and that Burundi drumming. It, uh, it just felt like a, a, a sonic explosion in, in many respects, or want of a, um, a better simile. I think Dirk Wears White Socks and Kings of the Wild Frontier are fabulous albums. I still like those albums to this day. Of course, after Kings of the Wild Frontier, we get what I call the pantomime years really all gets a bit um i don't know well certainly and certainly after the whole prince charming thing it's uh it all goes a bit belly up after that but those two albums those inaugural albums were just remarkable and made a massive impression upon me and of course as a 12 year old i peppered my room with uh posters and things like that used to buy in those days that with that specific look with the uh stri white stripe across his nose and, and that fantastic jacket of course now the jacket, of course, was worn by David Hemmings in the film Charge of the Light Brigade, which was released in 1968. Bit of trivia for you. Now, funnily enough, actually, I remember um, I was, uh, as I said, I was about 12, and in, I, remember, I remember going into a newsagent, and they had a box of seven-inch singles on the counter for about 10 p each, I think they were in those days. And I remember flicking through them. Now I took just enough money into that newsagent to buy some cigarettes, a packet of 10 cigarettes, because I was started smoking when I was about 12 because I under on the on the misunderstanding that it actually made me look more adult so I went into this news agents and I, I remember seeing the ant music single picture sleeve for 10p and I bought that instead of the the cigarettes and uh, I never never smoked again the next one is sticks paradise theater the next two choices are records that my brother had and played uh, to death of course we all have bigger brothers perhaps who have influenced our tastes in music he was very much into sticks. And it was interesting, of course, to hear these bands, these American bands. I mean, there was no internet then. Uh, you, you know, luckily we, we used to get exposed to some of this music on, uh, there was a program called Entertainment USA, and I think Sticks featured on that. But I, I loved the, the sound of this band. I remember playing Come Sail Away on the that live album they did, Caught in the Act, I think it was called. Playing that to death, I just loved the, the feel and the energy of that. But it was an interesting record for me, this one, because it wasn't all about color and sound but instead about excellent storytelling, drama, pathos, it, which all contribute to make this a profoundly beautiful record. Come back, Dennis D. Young. Uh, that's, what I, that's all I can say. I'd love to see Sticks with Dennis D. Young. I would love to see a proper remastering deluxe edition of all their albums, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. 52nd Street by Billy Joel. Uh, now, my brother was a huge Billy Joel fan. I remember him having to, uh, Turnstile Street Love Serenade on cassette tapes, which he would play all the time um, but this album this album was another one that was was played to death and I loved the vibe and the sound of this those very lounge hall jazz stylings and swing that it has and I love the cover as well it has a grainy almost dangerous quality to it with him stood out uh, outside what looks like a jazz club of course jazz very much influences the overall sound of this album and there's some marvellous numbers on there of course it's got Big Shot Honesty which are famous songs but the a song about escape half a mile away and the for quite frankly disturbing stiletto as well as the beautiful uh, use of joel's baritone voice in until the night destroyer by kiss now i remember seeing kiss on entertainment usa in 1982 i believe it was and i was just uh, blown away by it my mind was blown by the look the makeup the sound uh, i'd never seen anything like that I remember seeing Gene Simmons rising on this like dais, this platform, and you know, all tongue wagging and with the bad wings, the makeup. And then they played the "I Love It Loud" uh, video, and uh, I was absolutely mesmerised. And I remember going to town to buy an album by record by them. You know, you know, I had to go into town in those days. There was no Amazon, no internet, and you had to basically what what your local record store had, and they had a copy of the Destroyer album. So that's the one I bought. I played it, I was immediately captivated by those voices that segues into Detroit Rock City, the sheen and the production of it, the, the album cover, the artwork. It was, um, I loved the energy in the songs in Stanley's voice 
the great, the gothic grandeur of God of Thunder, of course, the rebellious flaming youth, not to mention the rather creepy great expectations with Simmons in full demonic libertine mode. My next record is a, another compilation album. It was the Rolling Stones' Get Stoned. I bought this album in a, a second-hand record shop. I remember lifting, lifting it out of the rack and being immediately struck by the rather grotesque cover and the artwork that seemed to speak volumes of the of the peril contained with the contained within the music uh, therein, so to speak. And I loved it. I loved the sneer and the lascivious quality of it. Uh, it seemed somehow dirty and illicit in some way, something I shouldn't be listening to. Uh, of course, my father hated the Rolling Stones, which meant that uh, it just compelled me to listen to them even more. But, you know, I was captivated by their, their sloppiness and their swagger. Uh, it was... Um, in fact, I remember uh, I remember buying... There was a video that came out that I, went, I bought. It was called Rewind. It was a collection of uh, videos, uh, promo videos uh, interspersed with some little bit of narrative going on between Mick and Bill Wyman. I was transfixed by Mick Jagger, all lips and arse, you know, he was just incredible to watch. And and then of course at the side of the stage there was a that threat suggested by the rather cadaverous looking Keith Richards. It was established in my mind then, as it is now, that this band are the epitome of rock and roll. The next one is Neil Young's Live Rust. When I was 16, I got my first job in a builder's merchant. And, um, you know, I was just sweeping floors and stacking shelves and doing things like that. I was all hair and pimples, both of which have gone now, of course. But there was a guy there called, uh, his name was Bob Westlake. And uh, I think he'd heard me talking about uh, how much I enjoyed Bob Dylan's greatest hits. So obviously he felt that I was into, uh, I wasn't just into the, the charts, I was actually into some pretty decent music. And it was him that told me that uh, I should listen to Neil Young. Neil Young is an incredibly important artist and I had to give him a go. And he lent me a cassette of uh, Neil Young's Live Rust. Anyway, I, I put the tape in and it must have been in the place to play the song My My Hey Hey, Out of the Blue, isn't it, I think it's called. And it just blew my mind. I mean, that angelic voice and chugging guitar riff. It was... Uh, and obviously, you know, I, I enjoyed, started to play more of it, enjoyed the other numbers. I think Like a Hurricane and Cortez the Killer is also on this album. There's no doubt that these songs took me places, shall we say, the narratives that unfolded, the the grunge and gasp emitting from this music was uh, was astonishing. King Crimson in the Court of the Crimson King. Now, this was a record that was lent to me by the aforementioned Bob Westlake, another Bob album. And the music sounded transcendent to me, otherworldly. It, uh, I felt like I'd um, crossed some sort of cosmic threshold of far-outedness. And it, you know, it spoke to me as well, the overall mood and timbre of it. Uh, now, you may find it hard to believe, as a teenager, I was quite a morose bastard. Uh, those of you who, of course, are used to my jovial and sunny disposition would probably find that hard to believe. But this record seemed to give some genuine legitimacy to my navel-gazing. And uh, I played it over and over again. The title track sounded so grand and regal to me. Uh, I felt as if I was almost honoured to be in the presence of this music. I think this was the album that sparked my love of the Mellotron. It's, I love the ethereal textures that it evokes. It's uh, an obsession that stays with me to this day. But the contrasts on this album that I found enthralling from the insanity of 21st century schizoid man from which arises the beautiful psychedelic whimsy of I Talk to the Wind. And that's before we get to the dark, sombre, gothic grandeur that is Epitaph. And anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this little trek down memory lane with me. These, as far as I'm concerned, are the 10 records that transformed my life. Um, it just leads me to say, but if you like my musings on music, please click like and subscribe and check that bell so you get notified for any future uploads. And for other ways to support this channel for extra content, if you're interested as well, do check out my Patreon. Now appearing at the two sides, here are videos you may be interested in watching. I think you should check those out. So it just leaves me to say, stay safe and please do keep listening.